Today, I'm happy to welcome my guest, Sarah Schneider. Sarah invented, produced, and trains conductors of the Human Journey Experience, a game which helps families and support groups develop belonging, the capacity for meaning-making, and communication skills in the heart of change. She also helps hospices, healthcare organizations, and social service organizations achieve their goals of family-centered, whole-person care as they address the cultural and spiritual spiritual dimensions of health and healthcare. Sarah, in addition, has a background in writing and directing for the theater. She has written a number of books. She has taught yoga and meditation, and she's been a hospice volunteer. She's an all-around amazing creative person, so I'm really excited to talk with Sarah today and share more with you about her work with The Human Journey, and you can find out more about that at the website the hyphen human hyphen journey.com so the human journey with two hyphens in the middle so sarah thank you so much for joining me today oh karen thank you so much for the chance to be with you well i've been really excited ever since i first met you and heard about the human journey the game in particular i really resonate with it as something i just i love the idea of it so i've been excited to share this concept with people and the idea that families or groups can use a game to help them change their interactions. And we'll get all into that. But first, I was hoping you'd just tell us a little bit more about your own story and how you got to this point where you're creating the human journey. Oh, th thanks for asking, Karen. Um, you know, I, to tell you the truth, I think that um, the seeds for this were probably planted years ago in Southern California um, through my mom's profession. And I've only recently recognized that there was a kind of a seminal moment then that was really important. Um, my mom had a job at the university uh, designing courses in biological and social sciences as continuing education courses. And she had a lot of the luminaries of the 70s um, come and speak for her and do courses for her. And she actually had Elizabeth Kubler-Ross come and speak. And I got to meet her um, as a young person and was very impressed and read, read some of her work and thought a lot about death and dying, um, even in those early years. Um, so when uh, I was in my 20s, later and doing a master's and doctorate in a field called performance studies, which blends cultural anthropology and different arts disciplines. Um, I was doing the graduate work side by side with starting an experimental theater company. And our very first piece was a piece, it, um, it was called Reprehensible Shoes. And it was about uh, separation in all its forms and that included um, death and dying. And it was organized in five acts, which were corresponding to Kubler-Ross's five stages um, at that time. And I just saw it as a really um, useful way to organize experience. And um, so I think on some level, there was that content um, piece that just kind of ran right through. And in my life, in, in my spiritual life, I discovered yoga um, for myself in the early 2000s, in 2000 actually. And it seemed very natural to me as I was reading more and more in yoga philosophy to become a, or to, to train to be a hospice volunteer at that time, um, which I did first in a, um, an outpatient site in Chicago where I live and then later in, an, in a hospital, um, hospice and palliative care wing. And so that was the content side, but I think there was also kind of a point of view side as well, which is that I did, my, my work has been across so many different fields from theater directing, as you mentioned, to um, anthropology and my graduate work as well, to some consulting that I've done in the organizational world. And every piece of that has had to do with either studying or organizing the behavior of groups. And so all of that skill piece also fed into the development of the human journey. 
Hmm. It's so interesting. I love hearing these stories of all the threads of our lives that end up weaving together somehow. And, yeah, don't they though? Yeah, and manifest into this work that we do. And um, I remember from our conversation previously, you talked a little bit about the stories we tell ourselves. And oftentimes they're stories of things that didn't go well in life. But I think it's beautiful to hear these stories, these ongoing stories of all the special little moments or encounters or experiences that have come together and, and fed into our work today. There's a teacher, and, I, and truthfully, I can't remember who it is, a spiritual teacher who, um, whose dictum is something like, what you think it's for is not what it's for. Oh, I love that. Isn't that great? Like the, the experiences that you are having that you can't quite make a place for at the time and you think are, are leading you one place actually lead you somewhere maybe entirely different. I think that's, that is one of the greatest blessings of growing older and having been around long enough to be able to <laughs> yeah. kind of look back and see how things, these things fit together. And that's right. Oh, I, I treasure them. Oh, yeah, a lot of things make sense when we look in retrospect, but that's a quality that your game, the human journey has, um, too, that I'm, that I'm really excited to share with people. So first of all, like what, what inspired you to want to create a game? What, where did that idea come from? You know, I've been toying with the idea of game design for a while. Um, Early on, I was, had been working on a game that never fully came to fruition. It was a game about the symbol system of money and the ways in which we use money to transact relationships in our lives. And so I had been playing with that on the back burner for a number of years, um, but didn't take that one forward. Um, and the game design thing was really interesting to me because it felt like a way to continue the rehearsal process that I loved as a theater director. It was a way to have people act in real time. And, and by act, I don't mean perform, I mean um, do actions. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I really liked that a game would have people act in real time and that the design of the game could, could somehow construct how that behavior went forward. Hmm, very interesting. And I know um, as a writer and storyteller, too, that you have used the hero's journey as a basis for your game. And that's familiar with, um, with storytellers out there, you know, as a, a construct. And so I thought it might also be helpful to our listeners if you just talked a little bit about the hero's journey and um, what it is and then how you've incorporated that into the game. Uh, Karen, a, a sidebar. I just realized there's something more I'd like to say about this. Your other oh, question. Is yes, that, yes. Go ahead. Yeah. Because um, you you had asked about um, why this content and this game, and I didn't quite answer that. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah, go I ahead. Like that. Um, my ADHD sort of took over. <laughs> and I answered a part of the question, but not the whole. Um, so, so the, the idea for this particular game came in t around 2012, 2013. I had gone through three losses in 2012 that were all taking place within a really concentrated period of time. And you know, it was quite a, it felt like quite a wallop. And my tendency when things like hard experiences come is to try to figure out how to aestheticize them as a way to, of dealing with whatever the feelings are. And I started constructing what I knew about narrative into what I was then calling um, frameworks for understanding our, our reality. I was trying to determine how do people tell their stories in ways that are healing to them and not just to them, but also to potentially a community or a small group of people around them. Because I, you know, I've been the recipient, as I'm sure most people have, of stories that are being told as if I were anyone else that they were being, uh, being told to, uh, in the sense that I, I didn't feel that I was necessarily helping the person by listening or that, or that I wasn't replaceable as a listener. And I was interested in these stories that allow for discovery in the moment of telling, both on the part of the speaker and on the part of the listener. 
And over time, I was kind of testing these different storytelling uh, mechanisms and really trying to figure out, it, just by writing my own story it, in a variety of different genres, trying it this way, then that way, and seeing what I thought was effective as a healing mechanism and, and as an aesthetic mechanism. And then I eventually decided that for me, what was most persuasive was an archetypal way of telling the story. And that's what led me to the human journey. Oh, oh, very interesting. I like the point that you just made about that. Sometimes people tell their stories for the sake of telling it, not necessarily for any kind of feedback or interaction with the listener, as, as you're saying. In that's right. and, it, and it's not that, that the retelling isn't, isn't, helping in some ways, because because a lot of studies show that the retelling is necessary. But I was really interested in the, in the telling that actually is impactful. Yes, that when a person is, is not just telling a story to ventilate the feelings around it, but to get feedback or connection with another human that might actually give them new insight or inspire or, them in some way. Or, or insight um, that comes from themselves that the presence of the other person allows for. Mm. And so it definitely seems like you, you've incorporated this story idea into the game, the human journey. And also uh, you use the hero's journey, I guess, as a, as a framework, if you could, Describe for our listeners a little bit about what the hero's journey is. Yes, absolutely. And, and I think I misspoke a, a couple of minutes ago when I said that's what led me to the human journey. It's what led me actually to the hero's journey. And the, the hero's journey is um, among playwrights and screen, screenwriters and mythologists and fol- folklorists, it's a very well-known, um, as you said, framework for organizing um, folk tales, uh, uh, screenplays, uh, stage plays. Um, the, the notion of the hero's journey is most famously associated with um, the world mythologist and folklorist Joseph Campbell from the mid 20th century. Um, but he actually isn't the first, <laughs> the first uh, person to identify common elements, story elements in the myths of the world. Um, I was thinking back to a, um, a structuralist critic, a literary critic named Vladimir Propp um, from way early, I think in the 20th century, who also was looking at common elements of, of um, action in different folk tales in Russian uh, literature. And, but Joseph Campbell did a cross-cultural study and developed what he called the monomyth which was almost, uh, which he presented as a universal myth of a hero who is um, situated in a in a condition that cannot last. Uh, the hero receives a call to go beyond what has been previously possible, and initially refuses that call, as a lot of us do. Um, eventually. Uh, unwillingly perhaps goes on an adventure that the universe is calling to him to have and um, slays various dragons or or, uh, goes through uh, certain obstacles and somehow wins, but is somehow um, scarred in some good ways and some hard ways from the experience and eventually goes full circle and returns back to home in the same way that Dorothy returns to Kansas um, but you know, when she returns to Kansas, to Kansas, it's in color. Um, she returns with a new sense of self um, and with gifts to bring back to the community. And that that was a piece that was extremely important to me for the human journey was the return with gifts. It's so interesting. Once I learned about the hero's journey, this this archetypal journey, I suddenly started seeing every movie I'd ever watched and analyzing yeah. and, yeah. You know, and seeing elements of the hero's journey in movies. And just the other night, my husband and I watched a movie together and we were both really disappointed in the end. <laughs> and he realized it's because it didn't follow the hero's journey. That's right. I mean, 
It yeah. left us feeling like what? Completely dissatisfied because there was no return at the end. That's right. Yeah. They yeah. sort of, I, I call them leaping off the cliff endings. Um, <laughs> and I, I find them kind of exciting actually, but, um, but because we've been so set up to, um, to expect this kind of return and this kind of closure, it's hard for us to even see a story that can exist outside of that framework now. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting. And I think, well, I was even thinking in terms of what we're all experiencing right now, the COVID-19 pandemic in some way, we're all being called to something <laughs> beyond what we've ever experienced before. And in a way, we're, we're actually being called to go inside and go within um, more so than going out on a, on a, on a journey outside you know, I- I, I think that's I think that's right. You know, I was listening to a lecture last night, uh, obviously online, um, by someone who was saying that um, it it could be that the challenge to us as um, a species or as humanity is to determine to what degree can we see each other, see ourselves as connected with one another um, after you know huge movement of um, separate separatism in many, many different ways, from nationalism to economic separation um, to many, many other kinds of forms, could the challenge of a a virus be the thing that helps us realize our interconnectedness? Mm. Oh, I love that thought. I know, I thought it was beautiful. Yeah, it makes sense. We've all in some ways been on journeys to develop ourselves as unique individuals and may have at times forgotten how how interconnected we are with other beings on the planet and this is this really is a good way to to bring us back to that place it, yeah I, I think that's right and you know I, I would say a couple more things about the hero's journey um, there are a couple more like layers upon that that I wanted to bring in doing the human journey um, Campbell had a student whose name was Maureen Murdoch, and she wanted to do a feminist uh, revisioning of the hero's journey as the heroine's journey. And if I've got this right, she asked Campbell for his blessing um, to to do that. And and his take was, well, there doesn't need to be a heroine's journey. It's already all contained within the hero's journey. Um, And she didn't agree, so she went ahead and, and developed her own system founded on that. Um, and in the heroine's journey, the, the obstacles, the dragons that have to be slayed have much more to do with internal healing and um, integration of the father and mother than with external obstacles. Mm. Interesting. And then it, what, what I did with the hero, with the human, I keep, I keep uh, switching them, but what I wanted to do with the hero's journey was treat both the individual and the group as, that, is, that participates in the, in the human journey as each a kind of hero whose stories intertwine. And so the, the weaving together that you were talking about um, that happens of our stories is happening at the individual level and it's happening at the group level in the human journey. Ah, ah very interesting. Uh, I, I'm not sure if this is similar to what you're talking about, but some, sometimes one of the things my husband and I have always enjoyed doing is going back through the years before we met each other and each retracing our steps and thinking of all the times when we actually could have met each other or our paths could have intersected because yeah. we were so close at one at several different points in time. <laughs> it never yeah. happened, but just feeling as if, wow, like there were all these possibilities of times in which we could have <laughs> met. Yeah. yeah. And all of the, you know, what the Buddhists call causes and conditions, I think, that, that might also have had to be in the right place for you to actually meet. Yeah, yeah. Very interesting. So can we get into the game a little bit so that we can tell listeners how it works and just oh, yeah. how it's set up? Well, so the human journey, it comes in a box. It comes in a, um, an eight by six by four box. That's a little tin box. And it looks like a board game. It has three decks. It has a board and board implements. But it's not the kind of game that you ship um, 
via Amazon or you know through some uh, retailer directly to people, it actually has to have a, what we call a conductor. So um, that person kind of lays the cards out and helps the family or the support group or whoever the group it, um, might be through the process. And it, it's set up in four sections. The first section um, is called the rehearsal section, and it actually follows a theatrical um, nomenclature. So there's a rehearsal section, and then there's Act 1, Act 2, and Act 3. And in the rehearsal section, folks choose two different kinds of cards. The first set of cards, they select the conditions that they were born into that they had no part in shaping, but that were simply, in a sense, the cards they were dealt in life. And then in the second phase of rehearsal, they choose the gifts that they were also endowed with. Again, that they didn't have to work for or earn, or they certainly didn't deserve one way or another, but that they um, were dealt. And these become just privately something for them to reflect on, and they may draw on those cards as they move on through the experience, but they, they aren't discussed with anyone. They're just um, held close to the vest, so to speak. And mm -hmm. some folks stop right there. I mean, just to, to name those conditions and those gifts without further discussion can be very deep for some people um, as a way of grounding them in their, their reality. Um, the game was initially devised with hospice and palliative care uh, professionals in mind and with skilled volunteers in mind as well as conductors. And the idea would be that they would help families kind of ground in who they are and show each other, um, show themselves to each other in their autonomy. Hmm. I like the idea that the foundation at the beginning of the game sets up the reality that we each have been dealt a hand of cards really that were outside of our control we didn't choose these things that have happened in our lives for ourselves and um and oftentimes we we can readily name those we were we're happy to talk about the things that we didn't have that someone else might have had or the things that didn't work for us but it's so nice to pair that with choosing the gifts that we were given at the same time so we get that sense of how they balance each other out mm -hmm. yeah I think that's right because it, um, when people choose those two things in pairs there is a kind of natural um, harmony in their sense of what they were given um, and, and part of the idea there is to have them acknowledge what, what happens for them in life as, as givens, um, that these are not, it, which is different from being victimized by experiences. Um, these are simply the things that are given. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And so that, that's interesting that some people just do the rehearsal and they actually get so much out of it that they, they don't need to continue on with the rest yeah. of the game. Yeah, there's an interesting express, like facial expression that tends to come up where they just sort of look meaningfully back at you and, and gulp. And, and, you know, it's sort of like, I get it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, it, it can be, it can be, um, moving for people. It, it, it can really be moving for people. Yeah. Uh, so typically we don't take a break after that. Um, we go straight on into act one and the conductor explains that there are listening challenges that the group will do with each other um, in each of the three acts and they, they shift from one act to, a, to the next. And so the conductor will teach the listening challenge of each act at the top of the act um, and the acts tend to follow a very, a very, very universal structure that parallels the hero's journey, the heroine's journey, um, and then also does, you know, what's different about the human journey in terms of weaving the individual trajectory with the group tra trajectory. And so the, the first act um, has follows just a rough developmental structure with early memories and um, senses of the divine or, or of ultimate reality, um, and then takes the person up to the point of separating from the family or becoming more autonomous as a, a young adolescent or young adult. Um, and then, this, then there's intermission, 
And people generally at the end of Act One um, are getting used to the idea of sharing in this way. And they're, they typically t- take that first intermission with a sense of energy and a sense of they can do this and it's going to be just fine and feelings aren't so bad after all. And, um, okay, and then uh, what do the next two acts cover? The second act um, has them reveal, in a sense, themselves to the others in the group as adults who have had to um, make hard decisions in life, decisions that have, in a sense, sculpted their own character. And so while they may have been formed by these givens in early life, these um, conditions and gifts, here they're, in a sense, taking responsibility for the decisions that they have made, but also acknowledging where they have found resilience and solace and um, strength that might actually serve as a resource to the others in the group as well. Mm, I, I like that. I like that a lot. And connecting the past and the, as you said, the the hand of cards we were dealt and connecting that with the decisions that we've made and perhaps why we made certain decisions or why those decisions were important. Yeah, I mean, even if people have remained in the same city where they were raised or the same um, duplex or whatever it may be as their family of origin, that the family may not always know the reasons behind a decision. They may simply know the external facts of a decision, but not, not what the, the sense, the felt sense of that decision was. And while people don't go into deep storytelling in the human journey, they go into uh, remembering in the presence of others. I can see how valuable it is for family members. When I just think about um, my relationship with my brother, Mm -hmm. like I'm aware of a lot of choices he made, but honestly, the underlying issues and reasons why he made the choices, I really don't know. And so I can see how enlightening it would be to be able to hear him talk about that and to to get that depth of understanding about him it's like trying to to in a sense put on their head and walk around with their eyes (laughs) or their heart um for a little while so that the the facts of their lives are actually their facts Hmm. very interesting Um, And so after that, we take a second intermission, or sometimes folks want to play straight through. And so from the actual narrative of life decisions, we then move, in a sense, to a future orientation. Um, As I was thinking about hospice and what um, would be a benefit to hospice, I think of families who have a hard time even visualizing the future beyond the death of the person they love, And so I wanted to create a storyline in which the death was not the end of the story. So in Act 3, what what we do is have the family start to intersect stories through various activities and to to co-create a sense of their shared future through really, you know, really simple prompts and um, activities together that... um, that, that in a sense have them see why they belong to each other or that, or even that they do belong to each other. Mm, that's really beautiful. And that's something I have never thought of before, but I can see the value of it now because I think you're right. Sometimes we only see the story up until, up, up until this moment that we're dreading when, when something's coming, we know what will happen and we dread it and we don't even dare to look beyond it or imagine beyond that. Yeah. It's, it's like your eyes get fixed at, at this one point at some distance from you and you can just simply not see beyond that. Yes. Yes. And in some ways I think that really heightens our fear because, because we, we don't even acknowledge a future after that event. And then we place so much more burden on that, on that event in a way, instead of seeing it interwoven into all of the events that are going to happen in the future. And then you're dropped, you know, after the death, then if that's the case, you then drop into this kind of emptiness um, that, that isn't, linked to any other part of your story. Yeah. I'm curious, um, 
do you often do you recommend the game say for families that are having conflicts or ha- are having a difficult time um, it, working it, together and making decisions? Um, a couple of answers to it's yes and no are the answers to that. Um, it depends on the skill of the conductor and and how they're able to manage the family conflict. I wouldn't necessarily put that in the hands of a volunteer. Um, but if the person who were conducting it were, were skilled uh, as a social worker or as a nurse or as a chaplain and used to dealing with the family dynamics, um, then I think that they would have the tools to be able to, to deal with the conflict. But um, the game is designed with some very strict ground rules that um, part of one of the, I, I call them the hats of the conductor, one of the five hats of the conductor is in a, in a sense to hold the ground rules, which um, ought to keep conflict from emerging in the, in the period of the game itself so that people are in essence tr- trained to hear and to listen. Um, so for example, when, one pers- when it's one person's turn, there isn't any crosstalk. Mm, and that, that makes sense. And that honors the that person and gives them the space they need to say whatever they need to say. That's right. And, and when it comes time to mirror what a person has said, if they haven't mirrored correctly, or if they're trying to present their own point of view at the point of mirroring, um, the conductor works with them until they correctly mirror. Hmm. Very interesting. Um, it's this all just suddenly what popped into my head was a memory of A young patient we worked with in hospice, she was a single mom um, who was dying in her late 30s of colon cancer. She had two young children, and she had had a really difficult life and had been in jail a number of times when she was younger, and she, she was just filled with regret and felt like, what am I leaving my children with? I didn't do anything in my life. I, you know, I wasn't a good person. I didn't do anything. And we ended up, we had a volunteer who helped her make a scrapbook of her life. She had all these photos in a box and she sat with the, with the volunteer and took out the photos and arranged them and told all the stories that went with each one of the photos. And by the time she was done, she actually had a really beautiful narrative and story of her life. And this the game is reminding me of that in a way of a chance to create this scrapbook for the people. I mean, in a in a sense, metaphorically, for the people that you love. Of these are things; these are parts of my life that I'm sharing with you, so that you can see them through your eyes too. Mm-hmm. I, I think that's right. It, it is a kind of legacy work. Um, the interesting thing here, though, is it doesn't put the, the patient at the center. Um, every person plays an equivalent role in this. And the benefit for the, the patient in, a, in an end-of-life kind of situation is that they get to see that the family is okay without them. Mm. Ah, what a good point that is. That the family has its own structure apart from apart from the the patient centered structure that's been created. Mm-hmm. Because Karen, have you seen um, folks who have hung on because they were worried about the family being oh, able to go forward? Absolutely, absolutely, all the time. Especially parents who can't imagine that their children will will be okay or will be able to survive without them. I mean, even older parents with grown adult children Mm -hmm. so so there in that case they would be able to see the the siblings communicating with each other sharing deeply with each other and actually holding in in a sense um behaving the legacy yeah that that really does make sense to me and seeing that perhaps the siblings or other members of the family each each have an interconnection that doesn't necessarily involve the patient <laughs> that's going that's right. to be ongoing yeah. and, uh, and recognizing that for the first time. Mm-hmm. And, and in a way it gives a chance for the patient not to be the, the it lifts the pressure from the patient um, who is receiving otherwise so much attention, but, but sees their, um, their story as connected uh, among, among many. 
Oh, yes, I, I really like that. And that now I see why it's, there's some similarity to that scrapbook idea, but it would be as if everyone's making their own scrapbook and that's we're right. all sharing right. them together. Simultaneously. And then, and then there's a scrapbook that's being created um, out of the individual ones that is, what, that is the family's own story. Yes, kind of the meta story in a way, I guess, exactly. of the exactly of, of the of the whole family. Wow, kind of going back to you and your husband and the things that brought you together at the right time. You know uh, the, that sense of um, the, you know you had s- several near um, comings together. It wasn't the right time. Wasn't the right time, and then finally you did come together. So these individual stories did start to wind together, but only in a certain time and in a certain way. Yes, yes. Which is, it's just so fascinating when you begin to see it that way. Well, I know that the, the game originally was created, I, um, I'm assuming, to be played in person with people sitting around a table, perhaps, and the conductor present but COVID-19 has changed everything. It has. Oh, my. Um, So I had been planning to uh, offer the training online for people outside. I'd been doing in-person retreats here in the Chicago area to train conductors and um, also in-house training. Um, But, uh, and the plan to do online trainings was going to, to take place starting um, Memorial Day weekend. Um, with COVID-19, the, the need to get this work out really began to be much more apparent. And, you know, I had this, this moment of really just being smacked in the, in the gut thinking, wait a second, not only are the trainings happening online, but the, but the actual administration of the process is happening online, and it may not be with a family that's all in the same place. Mm-hmm. So there were three levels in which the online experience had to be considered. Yeah, so you were forced to adapt a, a little more quickly than you might, might have imagined. Yeah, yeah. No, the, the whole cycle sped up in, in some very interesting ways. So this week has been the first week of training people online to be able to administer the process online. So I can imagine it. I guess it's the conductor has the game and the cards and then um, I think you were saying before sends out a PDF of the cards that they could choose for each one of the, the, um, the participants. Yeah, they're, they're conducting via, you know, if they use a telehealth system, they're using that or if they use Zoom, they can use Zoom or another um, system for um, staying in touch with folks. Um, but they, they actually um, are going to use a, a PowerPoint and select the card themselves and shine that card for the families. And then the PDF that they're going to send uh, to the families themselves is a rudimentary version of the board and folks can print that out, bring uh, board implements from another game they may have, and then get a little bit of a physical experience by, by working with the labyrinth of the, uh, the game board. Oh, I see. So interesting, but it still sounds like it has all of the elements in it that the that the game being played in person does. Um, though, I mean, we're all learning how to how to communicate at a distance now, and uh, that there's still some there's still a lot of value in it, and we can still connect deeply electronically. I, I think so. Um, and the other thing too, I mean, even as I was working with people online this week, I was seeing that. Um, couples, you know, it, it's inevitable that it's, when someone shares something, you have their spouse say, I didn't know that um, about them. And that can happen across Zoom. That can happen when they're in the same room, but talking to a conductor who's on Zoom, um, the sense of discovery about someone that you are close to, uh, particularly in the presence of someone who's more or less a stranger to you or someone who's not an intimate, can, it can be very deep. Yeah, and and I I want to say I know this is still um, a new pro, um, new process. I mean, so you're still developing this, but it seems to me this could be very helpful to families who are separated right now, who right. long for connection and closeness, especially if they have a loved one who's dying, and that 
this game could be a way rather than just coming together and having a, you know, a chat <laughs> online to, to actually play the game together helps people um, explore their emotions and connect more deeply, which is the one thing that, that we're all longing for and missing out on right now. Absolutely right. There's, I mean, it takes us back to that sense of discovery in storytelling that when you are prompted to think about something that you haven't really ever been um, called to think about in such a way before, you allow others to enter into your reality in a, in a really fresh way, and it's very intimate. And mm -hmm. that can be really connecting for families that are separated and just longing to be hugging or touching in physical ways that are not possible. And so if I, to make sure I understand correctly, uh, this, does this game require that you have someone serving as the conductor or is it possible for families to play it on their own? It, it, um, it really does need the conductor. The, the conductor um, teaches the listening challenges, um, essentially functions as um, the, uh, takes on this outsider role that, that works in a really important way because when people sense that there's a guest in the house, so to speak, they behave a little bit differently. Mm. Uh, they, they're on their best behavior. And that's one thing about the, going back to the families in conflict. Um, they, um, they recall things that they might not have recalled if they were only among their family members. And they, they say things that would otherwise not come up in ways that the people who know them well would never have heard in the same way in the presence of the stranger. Mm. Um, and so it's really important. This role of the conductor, it seems strikes me that this is something a hospice social worker or chaplain could do, could offer when they're looking for ways to connect more deeply with the families they're trying to serve that uh, if they were to be trained as conductors, this, the human journey game is something they, they could offer to lead families through. I think that's exactly right. It, it, it really serves, I mean, when you think of families that are um, not knowing how to start a conversation or not knowing what to say or, you know, feeling stuck somehow in some kind of communicative paralysis, this is a way for them to kind of move through that, to attune to each other. And if if some decision needs to be formed, they're, they're in a place where they know each other's values much more deeply than they did before. Mm -hmm. So it really is a tool. I, uh, who else do you recommend that um, would, would be a good conductor to offer this game to other people? The thing it really takes is um, the ability to hold space for a small group. And that might be somebody who's a retired teacher or a teacher right now could be somebody who is um, an activist or um, someone who has done public speaking or facilitation of other kinds. Um, it, it requires somebody who knows how to be quiet in a compassionate way, but also has the strength to hold the ground rules when people want to uh, kind of edge toward the boundary a little bit and can do that in a uh, witty or humorous or kind, playful kind of way. And I'll, so that can completely be a volunteer. It's not, you know, not all social workers will be skilled at this and, and many volunteers will be very skilled at this. My, my sense is that in the era that we're living in, a lot of people are aware of how much suffering families are going through and want to, want to help. Um, and so I see the human journey as a way to also be kind of a citizen um, a compassionate citizen for other families. Yes, yes, definitely. And so what does the, the training involve to become a conductor? Um, well, now that we're doing it online, the, the training is essentially two two-hour sessions with some self-study in the week in between and a practice session that you do with your own uh, small group of friends or own family members uh, or in-laws or, or neighbors. It, it can just be with people that you know so that you get used to the mechanics of 
doing uh, a conducting session. And I've, I'm finding that educationally, this is a really good format because people have the chance in that first two-hour session to just get an overview of what they're doing, to review what they've learned from the guidebook um, that I send out in advance, and then to uh, study up and then practice. And when they come back the second time, the, that two-hour session allows for coaching based on real experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so it's, it's, it sounds like it's easy enough. I mean, like they definitely have to be willing to do some work on their own explore, but mm -hmm. um, something that someone could accomplish in a fairly short amount of time to get trained. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. And then and they'll get more skill too as they go. It, it really once you're conducting, it looks as though once you're getting comfortable conducting, it looks as though you're not doing anything. In the same sense as a theater director, which is a little bit like this role, um, a, a play that has been well directed frequently looks as though nobody directed it. Hmm. Um, it has that invisibility quality. And so what you do as a conductor a lot of it is through the through things that you know you're doing, but others really can't see because they don't know what to look for. I have to say for myself, just hearing about it, it sounds like I would absolutely love being able to be a conductor because I love hearing people's stories. Mm -hmm. Nothing like inspires me more than just being a listener and being able to hear people's stories. And so I... I, I think that would be a really fun role to play. It, it is really fun. And it's, it's honoring and it's deep. Um, and it's just, and it can be just so delightful um, and moving. Uh, I, I would totally welcome you to do it, Karen. It'd be wonderful. Yeah, that, that I, I would have a lot of fun doing that. <laughs> I would say that. I'm just having been a doctor and a hospice physician, like that's how I spent most of my career, just listening. Yeah, yeah living, living in people's stories. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the funny thing about the, uh, the human journey, though, is in a sense, what it's trying to get people to do is hold their own stories a little more lightly and to hold the stories of their, their support group or their family members or whatever group does it together, hold, hold other stories a little more to heart. Hmm. I really like that because you're right. I think you mentioned before, sometimes our store, our own stories become so dear to us that we tell mm -hmm. them over and over and over again and don't, don't always see beyond them. Mm -hmm. So we, you know, it's like we have gentle gloves with other stories and we're willing to um, be a little more open to, to shift and change and um, morphing of, of mm -hmm. our own. Yes. Well, I'm curious if, if someone listening says, wow, my family needs to play this game. They would, you know, this is what we need, but they don't have a conductor. Are you able to connect people with, yeah. with oh, conductors? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I can connect them with trained conductors. Oh, that's, that's really good to know. So, so you're kind of the clearing house <laughs> for, uh, conductors people who want to be trained as a conductor can come through you but if someone listening knows like this is what would really help my family they can reach out to you as well to to find a conductor yes that would be fine so so people do people just go to your website in order to to do that to connect with you they can come to the website i have there an eventbrite link that takes them to um, a single page on Eventbrite where they can choose dates that they're interested in doing the training. And from there, I ship them the, the kits. It's, a, it's actually a beautifully produced kit um, with materials that you'll be able to use over and over and over again. They're really um, lovely. Um, or you could go directly to Eventbrite, and I think maybe we'll have a, a link up um, so that you can see what the link might be. All right, I'll put a link in the show notes for this episode for the podcast too, so people can just can go there and click on it to get to your website. I'll say it once more. It is the hyphen human hyphen journey dot com. So uh, that should be pretty easy for everyone to find. And once again, I'm talking with Sarah Schneider, the amazing creator of this game, The Human Journey. And I, I did want to just ask you one. Uh, one more time, do you use this game with groups other than families? With yes, 
groups of strangers yeah. or even yes. or people who are, are not well acquainted? Yes, um, folks who are in support groups um, in addiction work or uh, uh, I've, I've done it personally with a men's group, but there are other kinds of support groups, eating uh, recovery uh, or eating disorder recovery or uh, even grief support groups. Uh, it, it tends to bond them and to help them see a shared purpose going forward. I'm um, also talking with folks about using it with caregiver groups where the caregivers have felt very isolated in their own roles and could use a sense of support from, from a wider group. And, um, and that, that ends up being a very powerful uh, way of working as well. Mm. So if anyone is interested in becoming a conductor, you can look way beyond your own family and see, see the, how applicable this game is to lots of different groups and lots of, of different people who could be served by playing the game. Well, Sarah, I, I want to thank you so much for taking time out to talk to me today. And I'm, I'm very excited about the human journey and looking forward to hearing how it goes online. I think, that I believe that it will go well. It sounds like it's very adaptable to, to an online setting. Thank you. I'm, I'm learning that it is. I did not know that. But <laughs> it actually is looking like it, it is. And we'll have a chance to bring um, some sense of of deep connection at a time we really need it. Yes, and I, I'm really grateful that you created this game and it almost seems as if it's the perfect thing for the moment that we're in, as you said, the time when we need it. And so whatever forces set this in motion in the past, yeah. <laughs> I'm really grateful that happened so that the, the human journey is here now for, ev for everyone's use. Oh, thank you, Karen. This has been amazing to have this conversation with you. Thank you so much for, for engaging about it and helping me even learn more about what it is by our, our conversation. Oh, you're so welcome. And I'm, I'm excited to be able to share it with people. So we'll stay in touch. And I look forward to hearing more feedback from you in the future about how it's going. Thank you. Oh, gosh. All right. Meanwhile, take care. Oh, thank you. I'm right. sending you big hugs, Karen. Thank you so much. For, for, it was really a really heartwarming conversation. And oh. I so appreciate it. Oh, thank you.